Q. Anything from finance from the LEO's office? Committee member questions? Mr. Chu. I know this question is a little broader than uh, I think the specifics of this bill, but there's been a big conversation around how drug prices are set and uh, what our agencies pay for them. And I'm assuming, are you part of the working group, the interagency working group that's happening on this topic? Ms. Kent, you're shaking your head no. No, I I would need to call the director back up for that conversation. Okay. And I have had several conversations with Ms. Kent about this. This is our monthly public conversation, but what is the latest on (laughs) how the administration is tackling drug prices? Yeah, baseball and now tackling in football. (laughs) Right. People are tagging (laughs) other people into the ring, you know. Please, enlighten us. I need a swimming analogy. Um, Because I'm drowning over here. Um, (laughs) So I think that uh, we can continue to talk um, with our agency colleagues as well as other departments on the high cost drugs. I think where we have had some challenges is um, both the pricing that um, each of us pay within the various departments by and large um, are not always... um, readily uh, transparent or transferable. I think that we have also, you know, how we purchase drugs is very different. We at the department um, either uh, pay our health plans a capitated amount and that they go and negotiate with their PBMs or purchasers, and then we will reimburse for drugs on the fee-for-service side, which is very different than like a corrections or a a developmental um, center in which they are the direct service provider and that they have purchasing authority. And so I think the administration is still kind of talking through both a variety of options, looking at legal authorities for who has the ability to do what. Um, It has been... I think obviously of of concern in some of these areas, especially in the it's naloxone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's one of those uh, drugs that I think we are both encouraging the use of and the prescribing for. Um, just given the opioid crisis that we're underway, but obviously know that that is a drug that is um, and there's you know I think there's an article in the paper today around the increasing cost of that drug now that it's being readily um, prescribed or needing to be available. And so I think there's um, there are conversations to be had, but we're still kind of trying to figure out what is the best way that each of us can do something or do something collectively in which there's an impact on the drug price. And, and just a little context to our colleagues on that particular drug that uh, is used. Um, we've seen as state and other governments have decided that that is a drug of choice, uh, the price point for that drug increase 20, 30, 40 percent uh, just within the last year. Um, and uh, since we've been having this conversation now for a year and a half, what suggestion do you have for me as a policymaker and how we can accelerate this conversation? Speed up the game. Wow. Um, you know, I, th- gosh, I think that, um, I think that there are, tools in the state uh, toolbox that you as policymakers certainly can um, use to your advantage. You know, you as a appropriating body certainly um, bring a lot of weight to us as departments and as an administration in terms of what are we purchasing and under what uh, requirements, you know, do you place on departments to actually purchase those? I think we're wanting to be in a conversation with you about how do we leverage ourselves, you know, collectively as a state when it comes to purchasing power you know, I will you know, obviously point out our caseload, as we just said in one of our earlier agenda items, you know, we have 14 million individuals that are relying on Medi-Cal for um, their care. And obviously um, that means we require a lot of um, services and, and goods. And so I would I would like to say, you know, we're happy to engage in a conversation about using both purchasing power as well as you, you appropriate the funds by which we have to go out and, and work with um, contractors and vendors. And I think there's perhaps some creative ways to to do that, but probably not um, something that we have completely prepared to hand hand to you today. Um, I know there's a working group that's Mm -hmm. been meeting for probably the better part of a year. Um, Would it be appropriate? Could my staff, could we join that working group? Could we... How do we how do we understand what work is happening so that we yeah. can? Add no, I'm and be I'm happy to, to put together a meeting with um, the person that's been leading the, the work group effort in terms of working across both our agency as well as the um, the non HHS agencies. And then I think um, we'd be absolutely committed to sitting down with you and both talking about what we've learned, some of the challenges that we have in terms of um, options, and then 
and then we can go from there. We're, I'm happy to I'm happy to facilitate. That'd be great. That. Why don't we maybe uh, after this meeting, if That'd be great. Yeah. your people can reach out to my people and we'll uh, we'll figure something out. Um, as you probably know, we had a joint hearing between the Senate and the Assembly Health Committees last week on this broad topic, and uh, some of the things that we learned that agencies aren't either are not sharing or are unable to share uh, information of what their own prices are um, seemed, uh, frankly, just ludicrous that the left hand can't talk to the right hand on what prices they've been able to hammer out uh, in order to save costs for for government. Uh, The fact that it's just been such a difficult uh, topic to get our arms around and and there's so much that is opaque and not particularly transparent, particularly and even for government agencies that are spending the money that we have to appropriate uh, has made it uh, very challenging. And I certainly know we're talking about billions of dollars Mm -hmm. that if our committee was able to save in certain contexts, we could then spend in other contexts that that I think many of us would appreciate. So um, why don't we set up that meeting and we'll figure out next steps. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to switch to basketball as our Golden State Warriors are ready to win a championship. Let's dribble down the court and get on to the next issue. (laughs) Number 12. Uh, Electronic Health Records Initiative Program Trailer Bill. I'll leave that to you, Mr. Harper. If you choose to take us there, uh, we welcome uh, Karen Johnson uh, from the Department of Healthcare Services. We'll hear from Finance CLAO and Public Comment. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are ready whenever you are. So this proposal would authorize the department to increase the amount of the state general fund money that may be utilized to administer uh, the EHR, Electronic Health Record Program. So given the growth of this program over uh, many years, um, this authority is needed uh, to enable the department to provide oversight as well as audit activities as part of its responsibilities. So I'll just go ahead and dive into the questions. Um, How much is the current statutory cap on the general fund for this program? What cap is DHCS, the department, proposing? So the current cap is $200,000 each year, and DHCS is is, um, requesting to raise that cap from 200 to 425, so it's basically a difference of 225,000. Is there still justification for maintaining a general fund cap on this program? Uh, The general fund cap was established by the California legislature um, a couple years ago during the economic recession. We are unaware of the specific concerns uh, which resulted in the cap and whether or not these concerns still exist. How much federal funding has gone to the California health care providers through this program? So there's been over 18,500 um, eligible professionals and 260 eligible uh, hospitals who have received incentive payments. Um, uh, approximately $1.2 billion is what's been pushed out to date, and we expect probably another billion dollars to be um, pushed out as well. So I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you. Anything from finance from the LEO's office? A public comment? Any public comment? Committee member questions? Mr. Chu. I actually I don't have any questions at this time, but this is a subject that I've worked on uh, locally, and I'd love just to get if you have a white paper on what this program entails, just so I can start to get up to speed on it for the future. Absolutely, we'll that. get that provided. Great, thank uh, you. Later this week. Perfect. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harper. Correctly points out that we have uh, another uh, competitive California team, um, the San Jose Sharks. So why don't we slide on down <laughs> to issue number thirteen? Our marijuana study issue 427. You can tell it's the end of budget season. Everybody's getting a little punchy. We welcome Karen Smith, uh, the director and state public health officer at the Department of Public Health. We will hear from finance, the LAO's office, and public comment. Welcome, Dr. Smith, and we are ready whenever you are. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, this is uh, a, uh, a budget change proposal for a one-time general fund augmentation. We have a really unique opportunity to um, contribute to supporting an Institute of Medicine study of medical marijuana, the health effects, both positive medicinal effects, but also then potential unintended negative consequences. In, it, in beyond that study of the existing literature and bringing together of sort of the experts from around the world, there will also be a discussion of um, what has been the experience of those states that have legalized 
uh, recreational marijuana and whether there are particular uh, effects that societal effects that we should be putting surveillance systems into place for. And so we get to have kind of the, the United States premier um, entity to kind of really look deeply at the, at the um, science behind this. And it also, uh, very specifically for CDPH, we will probably get um, the best information available on things like what is a safe level of THCs for a particular edible product. And so that's something that rather than just um, sort of learning from our colleagues, we'll also be able to really say, here's what we know um, in terms of the, the published literature, but also the best thinking of the experts in the field. Thank you. Anything from finance, from the LEO? Uh, committee member questions, uh, public comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Tom Renfrey, uh, Deputy Director for Substance Use Disorder Services with the County Behavioral Health Directors Association. Uh, we support this uh, uh, proposal from the department but would it really encourage the department to focus on uh, the impact of marijuana use on adolescents? Um, you know, the 40-year-old uh, the guy living in his mother's basement, we're not sure we can really do much to motivate him. But we do have a chance with, uh, with youth, and we are uh, very concerned about the, the increasing levels of marijuana, youth, uh, marijuana use by adolescents and the, and the lowered perception of risk. So um, just... Uh, and we would also encourage the department to, uh, to look at some of the work that's been done on this very issue by, by the uh, county prevention uh, coordinators, especially in Ventura County, have done some really good studies and work on that issue. So if you, you know, rather than reinvent the wheel, maybe uh, encourage the department to, uh, to look at some of those as well. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your comment. And we do have hope and faith for all, not just youth. We believe this committee believes in substance abuse. Uh, treatment for for anyone who has a need, but we appreciate your comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you uh, We're moving on to issue number 14 uh, Change to January proposal on protecting children from lead poisoning issue 421 uh, We welcome Mark Starr uh, from the Department of Public Health Welcome, thank you. We are ready when you are Good afternoon. Mr. Chair members <coughs> assorted guests um, so this proposal is for 180,000 in uh, next the coming year and uh, 320,000 the following year for a geographic information system to be paid for out of the childhood lead poisoning prevention fund and it will enhance our capability of evaluating lead poisoning in children in California um, the childhood lead poisoning prevention program provides services to uh, children uh, mostly young children, toddlers, uh, those that are uh, lead exposed, as well as those that are identified as cases. And they get very intensive, the cases get very intensive home visits, uh, follow up with public health nurses, and environmental evaluation. And all that data is entered into our data system, which is um, called RASCAL, which is a very uh, catchy name. And, and it stands for our uh, response and surveillance system for um, childhood lead exposures. But that system is old and it doesn't have a modern geographic information system capability or mapping. So that's what this proposal is really to address. So for those of you that are, uh, no one here probably older than me, but some of us may remember that, you know, uh, atlases, encyclopedias, things like that had transparencies on maps and overlays. And so if you're not familiar with the GIS, geographic information system, that's uh, in part what this does, but it's in a computer. And it takes the information about lead cases in this case, information about housing, information that we gather when we visit the home about uh, potential sources in the home, which may range from paint, lead-based paint, of course, is the biggest cause, um, soils, lead and pottery, things like that. All that data goes into the RASCAL system, and what we need is the capability to be able to map all these different things, and they're all tied into the location of the child and that that's what a geographic information system basically does and in addition to mapping it does uh, sophisticated statistical analyses if I can say that word and um, provides a lot of information about sources exposures and helps us to prevent lead poisoning uh, going forward that's the gist of this proposal thank you mr. star anything from finance anything from the LEO 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Meredith Worden with the Legislative Analyst Office. As your agenda notes, uh, we have raised uh, some questions regarding uh, ensuring that this program maximizes um, uh, all dollars and uh, have noted that uh, there is a possibility that uh, Medi-Cal reimbursement isn't being maximized, but I do believe that the department has an update as to whether or not there is alignment with policy um, of the Medi-Cal state plan and so would defer to them. Thank you. Any committee member questions? Uh, public comment, comment on that or? Please, and if yeah. there's any public comment, please come forward so now. So what, what, what LAO is referring to is our January proposal uh, for this program, which lowers the blood lead levels that define a case. And there's a nexus with our colleagues that you just heard from at Department of Healthcare Services uh, with the Medi-Cal program, because those children that are cases, 50% um, 50, 50 of their, uh, well, I should say 90% of these kids are on Medi-Cal. And so there's an opportunity to capture some federal resources. And we currently do that um, for the kids that are on Medi-Cal. There's a 50% match um, provided by the Childhood Lead Fund, and the 50% is paid through Medi-Cal. So as we lower the case definition, the state plan amendment uh, for Medi-Cal that DHCS works on is being modified in order to um, change the uh, definition of a case there as well so that we can extend the 50% match from Medi-Cal to more children and capture more federal resources. So DHCS is working hard on that right now along with our department. Thank you. Any public comment on this item? Uh, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Starr. We will move on to issue number 15, licensing and certification, Los Angeles County contract issue 425. Committee welcomes Gina Asino from the Center for Healthcare Quality, Department of Public Health. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I also have with me CJ Howard from the Center for Healthcare Quality, and he's going to prevent our present our May revised letter for you, and hopefully prevent any catastrophe. <laughs> um, so we have one issue, which is the LA County May revision finance letter. This is a request for 2.1 million dollars in to increase the LA County contract. This is to cover cost of living uh, increases that were union negotiated between LA County and their respective unions. The uh, COLA is going to affect October of 2015 and October of 2016. And then there's also two other adjustments that occur in the contract, which is an increase in their employee benefits rate and a reduction to their indirect cost rate. Thank you. Well done. Anything that you wish to add? Nothing. Anything from finance, LAO's office. Any public comment? Public comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to issue 16. Thank you. Uh, changes to genetic disease screening program estimate issue 433. The committee welcomes Dr. Richard Olney from the Department of Public Health, Dr. Connie Mitchell from the Department of Public Health. We also have the Assistant Director of the Department, Leslie Gaffney. Thank you very much. Sorry. Welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Family Health. I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Richard Olney. He is our new Division Chief of Genetic Disease Screening Program. Uh, he comes to us from the CDC. We were very lucky to be able to recruit him from out of state to come to beautiful California. Um, he is a national expert in not only genetic diseases, but in birth defects screening and monitoring. And so that comes at a particularly fortuitous time for us here as we face uh, the Zika emergency and trying to establish an, our systems of surveillance. So we're, I just wanted to make sure that you had a chance to meet him um, because he's still uh, getting on board with some of um, our budgetary issues. Uh, Leslie uh, Gaffney will be presenting the uh, summary of the issues around our May revise. And Leslie Gaffney was just recently promoted to be my assistant deputy director uh, at the Center for Family Health. So charging right into this, um, we are rarely here uh, at May Revise. However, this year we are coming back and asking you for $15.2 million. Um, we will provide a significant amount of background for that. Um, 
medical billing uh, and billing of insurance is a rapidly changing uh, over the last few years, um, and we've had a fair amount of difficulties updating our system. We've been working with a Department of Managed Health Care, um, and they've given us some instruction on some changes we needed to make in our system a couple of years ago. Um, so we implemented those uh, changes and have been working to continue billing uh, processes to uh, increase our collection rate in light of the changes. However, we did recognize our need to move to um, a medical billing company to do billing for prenatal screening, which bills insurance. Newborn screening, we bill hospitals directly and really have no problem with collecting. But uh, prenatal screening, we're billing patients and their insurance companies, and it's a very complicated and specialized field, and it needs to be outsourced. So um, last year we developed an RFP and went out to bid, and while we were doing that, we ran into a challenge with our clearinghouse. A clearinghouse is a company that takes electronic insurance files and scrubs them, cleans them up, and then processes them, packages them, and delivers them to the individual insurance companies, so Blue Cross, Cigna, HealthNet, um, and then works on collecting them. Um, we're unable to um, come to an agreement with uh, our vendor uh, with regard to the privacy requirements that the department has. And while we negotiated with them for about four months, by the middle of October, we real realized that we were never going to be able to come to an agreement. So we've been without a clearinghouse since July of uh, 15. Um, we have been manually billing all of our claims. Uh, the problem with manually billing is not only do you do the work up front to manually bill, but you also do the work on the back end because manual claims get paid manually. So that's been a tremendous amount of work that we've had to add additional staff load to keep the billing uh, flowing and collections up. Uh. Uh, in January, we did uh, an award, a contract to um, a medical billing vendor company called Sutherland, and we will be implementing uh, beginning July 1st. So we will continue to uh, collect on the claims through June of this year, but starting everything that services offered July 1st going forward will be handled by Sutherland. We anticipate that eventually our collection rate will go up because they're a medical billing company that specializes in this, but for a while we're taking a wait and see approach. The second thing is the addition of adrenal leukodystrophy to the newborn screening panel. We had talked to you about this, um, that um, AB 1559 requires us to add adrenal leukodystrophy to the newborn screening panel once uh, it's added to the federal RUSP, and uh, Secretary Burwell added it to the list on February 16th. Um, when we were in the process of uh, writing the contract to create uh, a lab and a lab model on our Richmond campus, which is the same model we used for our SCID screening, um, we found out that it was not an option we could choose again. We needed to come up with a different uh, way to do the screening. And so that meant that we had to purchase $4 million of equipment up front. Um, we had not anticipated that cost. It's really not an additional cost overall, but it's the cost of upfront monies. Um, we had been planning to spend pay-as-you-go, paying the laboratory uh, company who's doing the lab in a lab uh, $8 a specimen as we did them. Now we had to purchase $4 million up front, uh, of equipment up front. Um, we are using a G-Smart loan to do so. So... That doesn't affect our budget, but the paying back of the G-Smart loan every year was not included in our no November estimate. So that's the addition there. And then the last thing is our CIS migration. CIS is our screening information system. It's the computer system that runs both the newborn screening and the prenatal screening programs. Um, when uh, the Department of Health Services was split in 2007, all of our applications were housed at uh, DHCS. Um, over time, the department has been moving them to our own, um, at, to OTEC, under our own um, staff sourcing them. Um, and in 2010, AB 2408 was signed into law, which requires that all mission-critical public-facing applications be uh, housed in a Tier 3 data center. DHCS is not a Tier 3 data center, and so we really have a need to move our application. Um, this is the last application that the department has left at DHCS. Um, 
Um, it's the biggest and the most complicated, so it's been left for last. Um, the plan was made um, early this year, or finalized early this year, to uh, make the move in 1617. Uh, was not something we had anticipated in the, the November estimate, um, and that also requires $4 million of upfront equipment, um, hardware, and software costs. We will also be using a GS smart loan for that, and those uh, loan paybacks were not included um, in the November estimate. Additionally, there will be ongoing support cost um, to start out. We will be contracting for the support because uh, CDPH ITSD does not have the staff at this time to support. So there'll be a couple years where we'll contract for it and then um, through the budgetary process we'll assess how much staff we need and make changes so that we bring that workload in-house. Um, so in summary, um, the unexpected expenses for 15-16 um, are an increase of $3.9 million for this year, 15-16. And then for 1617, it's $15.2 million. Um, of that, $1.6 million is state operations, and that's solely for the loan repayment. And then um, 13.6 in local assistance for the transition of CIS to CDPH, the support of CIS once it's arrived at CDPH, um, implementation of our accounts receivable system, and ongoing costs for our medical billing system. Um, in order to generate those funds, um, We've evaluated the increased cost and assigned them to the responsible program. So, for instance, for our CIS system, we split it in half right down the middle. Half of the cost is to be borne by the newborn screening program. Half of the cost is to be borne by the prenatal screening. For the billing, um, those additional costs would be the prenatal screening program. For the ALD increases, those would be for newborn screening. So um, we will need to raise the fee for newborn screening um, to $17.50 by 1755. We had originally projected $11 for the ALD and we've been talking to you about that for the last two years. So this would be 1755, which would um, raise the newborn screening fee to $130.25. And then we will need to raise the prenatal screening fee by $14.60 to $221.60. Um, you had a couple of questions. Um, that you'd like us to address, which was, um, when did we know um, about the need to make these operational changes? In late December and early January, all three of these things came to light. Um, uh, yes, we understand that the appropriate budget adjustments have been applied to DHCS's budget. Um, because the federal government pays for newborn screening and prenatal screening through fee reimbursement, um, we do not think that there is any uh, ability to leverage additional funds. And then... Um, the last question is regarding uh, the May revise. Yes, so... With the transition of the SIS. transition. So CIS has not... The one thing we have done is the ALD. So ALD, yes, we have purchased the equipment. Yes, we have uh, a loan in place, and we will be paying back on the ALD loan. We have not made any move forward with regard to CIS in light of what we're waiting to hear from you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, with no other members, I'll <laughs> dispose of that. Uh, anything uh, from the public? Okay, seeing none, help me along. Or there... Oh, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, seeing none. Any other steps I need to take? Okay, well, uh, seeing that, uh, thank you. That moves us to issue number 18. I'm sorry. <laughs>